understand. Grace, you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. The text for our consideration this morning is our gospel lesson from Mark 7. Listen again to these words of Jesus. Jesus replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you, you hypocrites. As it is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are but rules taught by men. You have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to the traditions of men. These are the words of our text. You may be seated. Dear brothers and sisters, through faith in Christ, they were watching. They were watching Jesus and His disciples. They were watching to wait for them to mess up, to trip up, to justify what they wanted to do to Jesus and His disciples anyway. And so there they were huddled around, waiting and watching, waiting to see what they would do. And this was not the first time that the Pharisees and the teachers of the law had had a little bit of an interaction, a little bit of a conflict with Jesus. You see, early on in Jesus' ministry, as Mark tells us earlier in the Gospel, there was a time when Jesus healed a man who had a shriveled hand. Jesus made him well, but the Pharisees criticized him for doing work on the Sabbath. Around that same time, they pointed out to Jesus that his disciples didn't fast like good Jews were supposed to do. And how come that was, Jesus? Why didn't they fast? Around that same time as well, Jesus and his disciples had been walking through a field and they were hungry and so they plucked some heads of grain to eat. But again, they did it on the Sabbath and there were the Pharisees and teachers of the law watching, pointing out the mistakes of Jesus and his disciples. And so in our text again, there they are watching. And they didn't have to wait long and they weren't disappointed. You see, Jesus' disciples, as they walked in for a meal somewhere, did not do something that was so very simple and so very obvious. They didn't take the water that undoubtedly had been provided for them by their host. They didn't pour that water over their hands, cleaning themselves so that they could eat with clean hands. Because you know that food came from the market and there's a very good chance that it had been touched by Gentiles. And so for these disciples of Jesus to go and eat their food without washing their hands, well, that was just too much for the Pharisees and teachers of the law. It was exactly what they were looking for. And so they pointed it out and they pointed it out specifically, why don't your disciples adhere to the tradition of the elders by washing their hands before they eat? And you might think Jesus would just maybe back off a little bit. I'm sorry, we certainly didn't mean to offend. But he does the exact opposite. Actually, Jesus goes a little bit Old Testament on those Pharisees and teachers of the law. He quotes Isaiah the prophet and says, Isaiah was talking about you when he said, These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their teachings are but rules taught by men. You see, the hand-washing thing was not in God's Word. It was part of the tradition of the elders. And the tradition of the elders was a long-held set of rules for the Jews to follow. Hundreds of specific rules that good Jews were supposed to observe. But Jesus doesn't stop there. He goes on to point out another instance where the Pharisees and teachers of the law had elevated their own tradition, their own man-made rules over God's Word. And it's a little bit of a strange example, and it's a little bit of a, of a, of a cultural reference, so bear with me as I walk through the issue. You see, one of, the, one of the rules, one of the traditions of the elders that Jewish culture observed and celebrated was the notion of korban. Now, in Jewish culture, there was a drastic difference between that which was clean 
and that which was unclean, that which was sacred, and that which was profane. But by declaring something to be Corbin, you could bring it from the realm of the profane and the ordinary and the unclean and bring it to the realm of the holy and the clean and the sacred. But what some Jews, including apparently some Pharisees and teachers of the law, were doing was using this particular tradition as a loophole to violate God's word. You see, in that culture, adult children were expected to take care of their aging parents. Now, I realize in our culture, sometimes it goes the other way, doesn't it? Sometimes in our culture, it's the aging parents who are taking care of the kids and the grandkids. But in that particular culture, it was the working adult children who had the responsibility to care for their aging parents. It makes perfect sense, doesn't it? This is a culture that has no social security. This is a culture that doesn't have 401k plans. This is a culture where if you had to stop working, you weren't going to be receiving any income. And so it was up to the kids to provide for their parents. But what some Jews were doing with this traditional loophole is declaring all of their assets, their money, their real estate, their, their, uh, their savings as Corbin. And by declaring it to be Corbin, they didn't have to, in fact, they couldn't use it to take care of their parents. But the great thing about it is they didn't have to give it to the synagogue or to God either. They could just keep it for themselves. And so Jesus points out this hypocrisy in the elders and teachers of the law. They had so elevated tradition over God's word that they were violating God's word by their traditions. But the question becomes, okay, so what? This is sort of an obscure cultural reference from nearly 2,000 years ago. What does this have to do with a Lutheran Christian in 2012? Well, you see, Jesus, in the words after our text, gets into what the real problem is, not only for those Pharisees and teachers of the law, but for us. You see, your problem and not my problem is not dirty hands, it's dirty hearts. The problem that you and I have is not that we might potentially eat something that had become unclean because an unbeliever touched it. The problem is that deep within us, we have greed and we have anger and we have lust. The problem that we have is not something that covers us on the outside. The problem that we have is what is inside. The problem that we have is not a problem of dirty hands, but of dirty hearts. And Jesus doesn't even hesitate to point this out. In the words after our text, listen to what he says. He says, listen to me, everyone, and understand this. Nothing outside a man can make him unclean by going into him. Rather, it is what comes out of a man that makes him unclean. For from within, out of men's hearts, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside and make a man unclean. Our problem is not dirty hands. Our problem is dirty hearts. But what the Pharisees and teachers of the law had done in devising and upholding all of these traditional rules and laws is the same thing that we often do. We set a standard that we are able to keep and then we convince ourselves that if we keep our standard, then we are good and right and holy. And so the Pharisees and teachers of the law gave 10% of everything they had to the work of the church. The Pharisees and teachers of the law listened faithfully to God's word. They never missed an opportunity to worship and they, uphold, they upheld all of the laws of the elders. Every single time before they ate, they washed their hands. They kept their own standard and they kept it well. But we aren't called 
to keep our own standard. We are called to keep His standard, which He gives us in His Word. And His standard is far more rigorous than a washing of the hands after a trip to the market. Because our problem is far more severe. It's internal. It's part of who we are born into a world of sin, born with sin inside of us, sin that then oozes out of us. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, let's not think that we are immune to creating our own man-made laws and then keeping those laws and thinking by keeping those laws that we are right and holy. For some, it's worship attendance. You know, if I just go to church on a regular basis, I'm all good. Look at all those people who don't go to church. For some people, it's the standard of just not doing anything horrible. You know, not killing anyone, not committing adultery, not stealing anything from the five and dime. You know, look at this world that we live in and look at how much better I am than they. For some in the church, it's upholding to a set of traditions that have been established in congregations potentially for decades or centuries. And the thought is, if I just maintain a connection to the traditions of my congregation, then if so facto, I am righteous and good and holy. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, our problem is far greater than keeping our standard that we create. We don't need this washing. We need this washing. We need a real washing. Not with plain old water to wipe off the unbeliever stink from our hands in the marketplace, but a real washing where the triune God Himself through the Word cleanses our hearts of everything in us that is evil and perverse. We need a real washing. And we have it. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, we rejoice not that we are so good that we're smart enough to follow the traditions of men. We rejoice that we are so blessed to have a God who gives us His Word and through that Word cleans our hearts and our souls and our minds. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, this text is a warning. It's a warning for anyone who would elevate the laws and rules and traditions of men over God's Word. But this text is also a reminder of the kind of righteousness that we have. And it is a righteousness not that we've created by adhering to our own standard, but a righteousness that Christ Himself has given to us in baptism. A righteousness that He won by His perfect life, by His death, by His resurrection. A righteousness that He gives to us as a free gift and by His grace we receive it and we rejoice in it. We rejoice that we are truly holy and truly righteous and truly God's child. Not because of our observance of anything, but because of the work that Christ has done in our hearts. God grant us the wisdom to recognize when we are following man-made rules or the standards that we have set for ourselves, but God also help us to recognize what Christ has done for us by His death and resurrection, what Christ has delivered to us through holy baptism, a new heart, a clean heart, a righteous heart, that we may stand in the presence of God and worship and praise and thank Him all the days of our life until we are able to worship and praise and thank Him into eternity. Don't worry about this washing. But thank God for this watch. In Jesus' name, for His sake and for His glory. Amen. Please stand.
<laughs> and now may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding may it guard your hearts and your lives through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.